The island of Chichijima, at first glance, may seem an unremarkable place in the vast Pacific Ocean. Part of the Ogasawara Archipelago, Chichijima lays some 150 miles north of Iwo Jima and 500 miles south of the Japanese home islands, and it is not even the size of New York City's Central Park. And yet, its geographical location made it a prime piece of real estate for the defense of Japan against the Allied powers, as they moved in on the home islands during late 1944, closing the noose on their enemy, who had raged across the Pacific and Asia two years before. However, this is not the story of some cataclysmic battle for control of the islands during the war. In fact, the United States decided to bypass them altogether in their march towards Japan, preferring to bomb it into submission instead. It was also not a site where, like at so many other places in the Pacific theater, fate intervened on one side or the other. Instead, the island set the stage for one of the most unnecessarily gruesome tales of the entire conflict. This is the story of the Chichijima Incident. Welcome to Wars of the World. Opening in 1914, a small naval base had been established on the island as part of Japan's burgeoning naval might in the early 20th century. The base nominally had a complement of 1,200 personnel, whose primary role was to support smaller naval craft such as minesweepers, subchasers, gun and torpedo boats, and also to maintain a weather station there. Soon, its role expanded to include the operation of seaplanes on reconnaissance duties and construction of large radio antennas, Chichijima thereafter becoming a major relay station for long-range communication between the Japanese Admiralty in Tokyo and the Imperial Japanese fleet. Such was the importance of the island that it was afforded a comparatively substantial garrison to defend it when war broke out with the United States after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Numbering nearly 4,000 troops, the garrison was even equipped with a heavy artillery unit, but the early months of the war were fairly quiet as the Allies were on the defensive. By 1944, of course, the situation was very different. US submarines hounded the Japanese home islands, meaning any ship that was put to sea was at risk, even when operating close to the shore. But for the garrison on Chichijima, the biggest threat came from the encroaching US carrier forces. The island was the subject of numerous attacks by American aircraft, which only intensified as the war looked set to close in on nearby Iwo Jima. The danger was such that the Japanese took the precaution of evacuating over 6,000 local civilians, while work began on the construction of an airfield at Suzaki, just big enough for fighters and light bombers. For the garrison based on Chichijima and the surrounding archipelago, 1944 was a rough year as they faced repeated airstrikes and regular shortages of food and equipment. Morale plummeted as frustration over being unable to fight back at an enemy who only ever appeared in the skies led to alcoholism and a breakdown of discipline, requiring Japanese officers to become physical with their men in order to keep them in line. To improve morale amongst their men, when American airmen were captured after their aircraft had been shot down, demonstrations in brutality were given, either to prove that the Americans were not invulnerable, or to simply invoke some perverse joy from the suffering of another human being. The stories of the types of war crimes committed by the Japanese have been burned into the annals of history, and the garrison at Chichijima certainly played their part with their prisoners. Captured American airmen were tortured in a variety of cruel and sadistic ways, and if they should survive such treatment, then the end would likely come with the falling of a Japanese samurai sword. The intensity of air operations in the build-up to the eventual assault on Iwo Jima saw some 100 American air crews shot down over a nine-month period in attacks on Chichijima. Most were either killed in their aircraft, and a lucky few were able to make it out to sea where they were rescued by seaplane or submarine. However, some were unlucky enough to become prisoners on the Hell Island. <laughs> 
commanding a Japanese garrison in the Ogasawara Archipelago was one Major General Yoshio Tachibana. Born on February 4, 1890, Tachibana graduated from the Imperial Japanese Army Academy in 1913 and had a fairly unremarkable career until 1939 he was given command of the Japanese Army's 65th Infantry Regiment prior to its participation in the Battle of Zhaoyang Yichang against Chinese forces in Manchuria. Having experienced commanding a regiment in battle, he was soon on track to becoming a general and eventually assumed command of the troops defending Ogasawara in 1943, whose numbers throughout the archipelago had now swelled to over 25,000. Tachibana had no empathy for the downed flyers captured by his men. Japanese army captain Hiro Kasuga later revealed to allied interrogators that he made a brief stop on Chichijima on his way to Tokyo towards the end of the war and observed prisoners tied to stakes, not receiving food or water for days at a time. He claimed to have taken sympathy on the men and used the distraction of another American air raid to feed some of them rice cakes, if only to ease their suffering for a time. Tachibana's sadism towards the treatment of his prisoners was only fueled by his persistent alcoholism, which seemed to unleash his creativity when it came to finding new ways of inflicting suffering, such as having his men stab a prisoner with sharpened bamboo sticks. But the worst was yet to come. On September 2nd, 1944, the aircraft carrier USS San Jacinto prepared to launch another air raid on the island, its Avenger bombers being tasked with striking Radio Station 6, which helped Japanese aircraft with navigation over long ranges, a high priority target indeed. Each Avenger was armed with four 500-pound bombs clutched inside the carrier bomber's narrow bomb bay, and each had a crew of three, a pilot, a radio operator, and a gunner. Among those pilots taking off from the carrier was one 20-year-old lieutenant junior grade George H.W. Bush, who at that time was the youngest pilot in the Navy and had already participated in several raids. The Avengers began taking off at 715 hours and headed for their targets, flying over the island at over 8,000 feet until they reached their target, this allowing them to fly above the altitude the Japanese anti-aircraft gunners could reach for as long as possible. Bush and his comrades arrived over the target area almost one hour after takeoff, and in the early morning light, he could clearly make out his target, the tower casting a long shadow over the terrain, as though a black finger were pointing at it for him to see. The Americans soon began their dive onto the targets, this increasing their speed dramatically up to 350 miles per hour, far in excess of the bomber's design speed. But of course, the reduction in height also brought them within range of Japanese guns, which were now manned by seasoned gunners used to American tactics. On the ground, the commanding officer at the radio station, Imperial Japanese Navy Commander Shizuo Yoshi, who had only taken up the role four weeks before, was incensed by the American attack and vowed to kill as many of them as possible as he ordered his men to open fire. Beginning his dive, Bush found himself flying through intense anti-aircraft fire with bullets and shells racing past his Avenger. It was not long before he realized he would not be coming out of this attack unscathed, as his aircraft began vibrating and ringing with the sound of hot lead striking the aircraft's aluminium skin. Even more worryingly, his right R2-600 twin cyclone engine was also starting to make the telltale indications it had been hit, but Bush stayed committed to the dive and placed his bombs on target before pulling out and heading back to sea. By now, his engine had caught fire, with flames and smoke billowing from the engine cowling. He knew his aircraft was mortally wounded, and therefore they would have to ditch, but also knowing what might happen to him and his crew if they were captured, he tried to get as far from the island as possible. Bush nursed the Avenger to the northeast of Chichijima before giving the order for his radio operator and gunner to bail, but only he would manage to escape. One of the other men couldn't get his parachute to deploy, while the other wasn't able to jump from the plane in time. Bush watched in horror as his plane and crew crashed into the ocean, while he floated down almost serenely into the water. From the shore, some Japanese sailors had witnessed the Avenger go down and immediately took to their boats, hoping to capture an American and get a little revenge. 
However, it was not long before they found themselves under attack by two of the Avengers from Bush's squadron, who wanted to keep them away from their downed comrade. A few hours later, he was stunned to see an American submarine, the USS Finback, appearing from beneath the waves to rescue him, its crew having traversed a minefield in order to reach his position. Bush had been spared capture by the Japanese, but eight other aircrew were not so lucky, bailing out of their aircraft close enough to shore to be scooped up by the Japanese, who immediately took to giving them their usual welcome to American prisoners. Grouped together, the captured airmen looked on in horror as one of their number, radio operator Marvel Mershon, who was only 19 years old, was manhandled by a Japanese officer and then tied to a tree after which the Japanese troops were instructed to begin beating the man without mercy in full sight of his comrades. After hours of this relentless beating, Mershon was untied and led away into the jungle. His comrades would never see him again. Mershon was taken to a freshly dug grave, over which was standing a Japanese soldier carrying a sword, and the American must have had no doubt about what was about to happen. According to testimony from witnesses after the war, Mershon was put on his knees and handed a cigarette which he was allowed to smoke without interruption before he was blindfolded and instructed to extend his neck, after which he was decapitated with the sword and then buried. Shortly after his execution, Tachibana was engaged in one of his late night drinking binges and was heavily intoxicated when he declared that his officers and men would have to prove they had the right fighting spirit to win the war, and to do so, he concocted a truly horrific test for them. They were to dig up Mershon's body and feast on his flesh. Soldiers were sent back to the gravesite and began to exhume the body of the dead American. An army surgeon was then told to amputate Mershon's thigh and give it to the cooks, who then created a meal out of it using soy sauce and vegetables to give it flavor and a glass of sake to wash it down. Perhaps eager to prove they had what it took to Tachibana, Many of the officers who were served pieces of Mershon's thigh claimed that the meal was delicious, and so Tachibana ordered more pieces of Mershon to be cut up and cooked. Almost a month later, Tachibana began to contemplate testing more of his men with the remaining prisoners. The seven men were taken out to a rifle range, where 25-year-old Floyd Hall was separated from the rest and tied to a wooden stake. Apparently, this was not a pleasant duty for some of the Japanese officers, since during his time in captivity, Hall had managed to befriend some of them to a degree by learning Japanese words and customs and even attending parties with them. He had been a very careful prisoner, perhaps hoping this would spare him the blade, but it was not to be. After being tied to the stake, he was then used for bayonet practice, suffering an excruciating death as he was stabbed over and over again. Once dead, Tachibana ordered his surgeons to begin harvesting his liver and gallbladder for consumption, and all of this happening in full view of the last six prisoners. The Japanese then selected Earl Vaughan to be their next victim, but the 22-year-old Texan decided that he was not going to be killed like Hall, and began struggling with his captors, hoping they would kill him quickly. Reportedly, he even extended his neck to the guards, hoping one of them would decapitate him. Finally, the Japanese became frustrated with the belligerent American, and so he was beheaded, with the surgeons then appearing and again removing organs for consumption by Tachibana and his men. That night, high-ranking army and navy officers were invited to feast on the dead men's organs. Over the coming days, the remaining men were all brutally killed, and their organs harvested for more of Tachibana's tests. At least one of the prisoners was not killed before his organs were removed by the surgeons, Tachibana believing this would keep the meat fresh for longer. For some of those invited to taste human flesh, there was a degree of pride involved that they had passed Tachibana's test. However, not all seemed to meet his criteria for having the fighting spirit. When a group of naval officers were given a soup containing human organs, for example, they reportedly vomited, much to the amusement of the soldiers. After the war, the US Navy interrogated Tachibana and some of his senior staff to discover what had happened to their downed aviators. Initially, the Japanese claimed they had only captured six airmen and that two were sent to Japan via submarine for interrogation, after which their fate was not known 
while the remaining four were killed by American bombs during the many air raids on the island. These were believable explanations, as both had occurred with prisoners at other locations, but the American investigators soon began picking holes in the story, and eventually, the whole grisly truth came out. However, American authorities decided not to make public the fact that their Navy men had been eaten by the enemy. There was already enough evidence to charge the Japanese officers with war crimes that would give many of them the death penalty, including Tachibana, and it was felt that revealing the truth would only further the pain suffered by the men's families, who were already having to deal with the deaths of their husbands, fathers, and sons. It would be some 60 years before the truth was acknowledged by the US government, following research carried out by author James Bradley. Tachibana, along with three other officers present during the incident, were sentenced to death following their war crimes trial on the US island of Guam. However, he was not charged with cannibalism, as this didn't fall under established international law as a war crime. He was hung on September 24th, 1947. As for Lieutenant George Bush, he would enter politics, and on January 20th, 1989, was elected as the 41st President of the United States. He would not learn how narrowly he escaped the fate of his comrades until Bradley's work, after which Bush would admit to feelings of guilt to having been spared as the ninth victim of this truly ghastly chapter in the story of World War II.